Hello everybody. So now we're, we will be going into The Republic by Plato. And as we ended with Socrates and the defense, we know where Socrates, who, how the way he was condemned by Athenian society and critiquing that unjust and unscrupulous society. And one of this, and this is a, one of his last passages, right? But this is kind of where we were reflecting upon um, is it better to be just and appear unjust or to be un unjust and appear just? And if we're thinking in the realm of politics, we're thinking of Socrates, but we're also thinking today in the realm of the political world and how people appear. So in the realm of appearances, that projects power. When, when we get to uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, one of the early modern thinkers, he makes uh, appearances be, uh, as central to the formation of acquiring a mass mass appeal or this populist uh, form of rhetoric out in society and gaining support. So now that we're shifting to uh, Plato, who was a pupil of Socrates, we are thinking, how do we know what we know? Right? Remember that realm of epistemology, of knowledge, knowledge production. So, one, just to re recap, the search for justice is the highest honor. Right? You recall, the unexamined life is a life not worth living, said Socrates. And this is something that we pursue in our present society. Uh, we want to know. Um, and how we think about th these things and political issues really take us to dig deeper and want to know more. And for Socrates, uh, as he mentioned, if you want to remain a, a moral human subject in, in that pursuit of an ethical life, stay out of politics. He said he made it very, very clear. Right? And now we're thinking of contemporary politics. The politicians that we see, we can see it maybe heed his warning, right? And many, for many in society, that is maybe what turns them off from entering that polit so-called political world because they see the unethical behavior of so many politicians the world over. Um, so now we enter the mind of Plato some more. And in the Republic, as we mentioned, there's that famous picture of Plato Socrates. And in the Republic, the Republic is seen as the first uh, text of political science, right? So when we're thinking about, so political science as we know it was premised upon one, one discipline, the discipline of philosophy, political philosophy. And this, and this now has been kind of overtaken by, not overtaken, but the expanded by American politics, uh, comparative politics, international relations, um, and, com and so to speak. So as we're moving through this, these are principles that will guide us, not only as political science students, but as citizens in, in, in attempting to acquire information in our society. And the main object, and I take this from A.R.M. Murray, this is a quote, the main object of the dialogue, again, in the Republic was to refute the sophist theory. Remember those th sophists who were those paid tutors that we read that trained the elite, the students of the elite in order to maintain that unjust society in, in the city-state of Athens. So that moral principles have a sub to refute again that idea that moral principles have a subjective foundation, right? So when we're thinking about this, if we in contemporary society, um, well, morality is subjective. Okay. Uh, Plato is thinking the opposite. Socrates is thinking the opposite. It is objective. We have some form of knowing between right and wrong. Right? So now think, put yourself in this moment, how do we know what is right and wrong? Right? We're still driven by this main, this idea of objectivity, the universal form of, of what is good. So that's how we're reading Plato. That's how we're thinking about what is the ideal state? What is that ideal republic? So it is an ethical good. And how do we get there? Right? So how do we get to that goodness? And this, this is what you'll be reflecting upon in your discussions and thinking about. It's how do we get to that idea of justice? Right? We hear this a lot. Right now we're talking about racial justice, social justice. What is justice? Is that aligned with Plato's view? Uh, we have different degrees on 
that you can major in from criminal justice to social justice, same name, but opposite meanings, right? And the way they're applied in the world. So this idea comes from an ethical, political, ph philosophical perspective, again, grounded in metaphysics, metaphysics meaning knowledge gained outside of the physical world, right? Or that a priori sense of knowing and psychology. So, and as we're reading the Republic, you know, and this is when we're thinking of the concept of democracy as, as a universal, and we're moving to the space where the people will speak, right? For Plato, the idea of a democracy is when the poor win. Do the poor win? Do we actually have a democracy here and now? Because that would require that everybody in our society has a say and do they have a say so there is the and i raise this point just to get us to see beyond the idea of democracy as one as, uh, casting a ballot but democracy for plato is something to be averted and democracy was something to be averted by the framers of the constitution in the united states because that would be that the mob have, would have the ability to maybe rule and enact a form of demo, a democratic polity. So as we're thinking through this and we're thinking about the reality here in, in our moment, how does that reflect? Right? And for one of the most influential American thinkers in the early 20th century and to the present, um, who was the first African-American to earn his PhD at Harvard in 1898, uh, W.B. E. B. Du Bois uh, kind of had a falling out with this idea of American democracy, an American democracy that was an apartheid system while he was living during uh, Jim Crow. And, I, and he believed that the electoral realm, meaning going and casting a vote, sustained this uh, undemocratic polity. He, he said, I believe that democracy has so far disappeared in the United States that two evils exist. There is but one evil party with two names, and it will be elected despite all I can do or say. And I raise this, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, in relation to the, the Socratic and Platonic view of democracy, because he's kind of he is illustrating here that the people in the United States don't have a say, especially in his moment, right? So we know how African American, indigenous peoples were not even. Uh, when he's speaking, uh, not citizens of the United States, many people are cast out, uh, women. So let's think about how that universal is actually applied and exists in the real world of democracy or justice or the good. And we're living in a moment where this is kind of very explicit, denied by some and pushed by others, right? And we're heading into a place where we have a we have a two-party system in the United States, and this is what and who rules those parties. So when Thrasymachus takes on this notion of justice, justice is in the interest of the stronger, or might makes right. Whoever has the power determines what justice is. This is the view from Thrasymachus when Socrates begins the dialogue and begins to expound on, on this question of justice or goodness. How can we achieve this? Thrasymachus has a really quick reply. And this Thrasymachus is very powerful in the statement be, because as students of political science, we're looking around the world and looking at who is determining law. And it is not the people or a, um, or a form of democratic participation, which is coming to a consensus and building and establishing a law. But we see, we're looking at the models of nation states, we see nation states who dictate to others, right? This form of maybe build uh, imperialism on many levels, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural, whatever it may be. So Thrasymachus may be ring true on the surface, but this is where Socrates is able to um, dis discard this, this assumption or this very superficial uh, view of justice, okay? So as we begin to think about what we're 
how we're uh, trying to achieve and what we're trying to do in political philosophy is really get deeper, deeper into an understanding of how these ideas, how these theories begin to set the ground before something is made in the world. Right? And a theorist I used last semester, Gloria Anzaldúa, tells us before anything can exist in the real world, it must be imagined. Right? And for us as students, this is where we're trying to go. We're always trying to imagine, be creative. We know at times society attempts to kill our creativity in order to shape our conformity into a system of power. But as individuals in a democratic polity and as simply human subjects with rights and a form to exist and to express ourselves, we go beyond those boundaries. And this is where we are trying to really become uh, informed and build upon this analytic frame, right? So for Plato, it is the, the fundamental principles in the Republic are there is an immortality of the soul. And this is where we'll get into the Platonic uh, Plato's theory of forms, right? And there is a, secondly, there's an objectivity of moral standards. Right? No subjectivity, no I agree, let's agree to disagree. No, none of that. It's a, it is about there is, in moral philosophy, there is a right and there is a wrong, right? Um, and, there, and thirdly, there is a reality of an unchanging world beyond the world of sense and time. So as we're thinking about how can we even begin to imagine an ideal state, nation state, right, from our standards? Well, there is an ideal for, for, for Plato, there is an ideal polity, and that's what we're getting in the Republic. On the way it ought to be constructed, it does not exist, exist here, but it exists in an unintelligible world or in the metaphysical realm outside of the natural world. Right? Just like this chair and this desk that I'm in front of, how did one know to create this chair? Well, there's an ideal that we can, we can envision that exists in that unintelligible or metaphysical world. So this is going into the theory of, uh, of forms for Plato. So in that world of appearances, there are things that we can see here, right? And I you know, have this comical look at a cat. There's a cat, but that cat is simply a resemblance of that ideal cat, right? That one that we want to, that we are trying to uh, craft our cat into. So things that exist um, that beyond this world are those ideal. And we use this, he uses this theory of forms to demonstrate a larger belief that there is such an, as an ultimate objective truth or a way we ought to be. Not the way we are, but the way we ought to. And I just want to point to this phrase here, the ought to be phrase, because once we think of this ought to be phrase, or we ask a question in that beginning with this, this is a moral-based questioning, a moral-based platform to begin our inquiry, rather than how is the world, right? We can see and describe the world as it is, and we can describe all the injustices, but how must it ought to be would now take us into that moral or ethical realm of wanting to know and to create something different. Right? So as we're thinking of justice and we're thinking of how, you know, here are just some definitions of the, of the goodness, trying to decipher what, what Plato is laying out. How would you define this concept? Right? Where do we see this in the contemporary world? And, we're always linking the Republic as a foundational text to understand or gain an understanding of how, what, what is justice? You know, I asked about criminal justice, social justice, very different things, different meanings. So what is it in that universal form? And that's what we're trying to get out in Plato. We're thinking of these notions of freedom here. And this is from Isaiah Berlin, just thinking of negative liberty, positive liberty, right? Uh, and I'm just going to gloss over this guy. I want to move over to John Stuart Mill's taking on Isaiah Berlin's notion. John Stuart Mill, a classical liberal uh, philosopher in the realm of John Locke. Because we have a lot, a lot of contestations over another concept of freedom, justice. So for John Stuart Mill, one's freedom ends when it infringes upon another. And think about that. We are all free to do things, but as long as we are not causing harm to others. We're going to get to pick this up in 
John Locke a little bit later, but for now, let's get into the Republic.